In Minneapolis, see the Buicks at Swanberg and Sheafy Buick Company on the corner of University and Hennepin or Win Stevens Buick Town 2370 South Highway 100. Minnesota Congressman William Frenzel today joined 14 other House Republicans in a letter to President Nixon expressing their concern over the use of what they called high-level bombing attacks against targets in Southeast Asia not directly related to the need to blunt the current invasion of the South. Frenzel said this meant the bombing by B-52s over North Vietnam. He said it gives us the posture of the aggressor. President Richard Nixon and National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger struggled to forge a peace between South Vietnam and the communist forces of North Vietnam. As the U.S. presence in Vietnam diminishes, there is finally hope for an end to the war. 1972 is the year that the war in Vietnam experiences a false start towards peace. It is also the year an overwhelmed president begins his own fall from grace. After the testimony of the three released prisoners of war and reports of multiple POW deaths, there is no doubt of the abuses unleashed by the North Vietnamese captors. Intelligence indicates that Son Thê, a small camp 23 miles west of Hanoi, is holding approximately 55 POWs. It is in the heart of North Vietnam, and surrounded by thousands of North Vietnamese soldiers. President Richard Nixon approaches the Pentagon about enacting a daring rescue. General Donald D. Blackburn, Special Assistant under Army General Earl G. Wheeler, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, is up to the challenge of engineering it. He works with the Defense Intelligence Agency, National Security Agency, and the CIA in an unprecedented operation. In July 1970, the Joint Chiefs of Staff give their approval. The top secret mission will take the cooperation of multiple branches of service, the Air Force, Army Special Forces, and Navy. The teams including 56 Special Forces troops, specifically handpicked for this mission and volunteer only, train in a life-size mock-up of Sun Tae at the Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. Their secret training begins on August 20th, and they will log a total of 1,000 training hours. The Air Force is under command of Brigadier General Leroy J. Manor, and the Army under Colonel Arthur D. Bull Simons. Their plan is both brazen and daring. The Air Force assault will fly the Special Forces soldiers at night to attack enemy troops on the ground, free the prisoners, and then escape by helicopter. The Air Force will provide attack and suppression fire, while Navy aircraft will provide a nearby diversion with flares. November 20th, 1970. The soldiers' intense training is about to pay off. From a location in Thailand, five small attack planes, two support craft, and six helicopters take off under cover of night. It is 0218 hours when the choppers arrive at Son Tae. Flares light up the night sky as one copter destroys guard towers and decimates barracks with a hail of machine gun fire. Another helicopter does the unexpected. It crashes intentionally in the midst of the camp and unleashes its group of Green Berets. They rush towards cells to rescue the captive POWs as another copter lands outside the camp to provide attack fire and deposit more Green Berets. The fourth helicopter accidentally lands at another compound, confused by the fog, and the Green Berets engage in a firefight with North Vietnamese forces. There are no casualties. As two-man teams rush in to check the cells, the unfortunate truth is relayed to General Manor at his command post. Search complete, negative items. 
There are no prisoners in Sante Prison. The entire raid only takes 28 minutes, with no American casualties. The only injuries were a minor thigh wound and a broken ankle between two raiders. 42 North Vietnamese guards are killed. A North Vietnamese surface-to-air missile hits its mark and destroys an F-105. The two-man crew bail in time and are rescued by two of the helicopters. Operation Ivory Coast is viewed as a failure by many, including the U.S. media. The intense preparation and training led to a strategically successful mission, with the weakness being in U.S. intelligence. Earlier, on October 3rd, reconnaissance detected a decline in activity. Photos had shown weeds growing in areas usually worn by POW foot traffic. Photos also showed Sante abandoned leading speculation of POWs being confined inside for disciplinary reasons. Later films contradicted this and showed a definite increase in activity. The fear from critics is that the failed rescue will push the North Vietnamese to further abuse, if not execute, their POWs. In fact, the effect is just the opposite by forcing them to consolidate POW camps as a preemptive countermeasure, POWs are given better conditions. At the Hanoi Hilton, POWs are placed in a communal block of up to 50 each and begin to receive better treatment at the hands of their captors. In November 1970, the Army Special Forces raided a camp at Sante, about 20 miles west of Hanoi. And they went in there, we'd been evacuated a couple of months before uh, due to a flood, and the monsoon came. They didn't want to fly any jets over the camp to they might tip a raid off. So they didn't know we had, had, uh, the camp had been evacuated. But it will still be a long road for the prisoners of war. The Ho Chi Minh Trail. It runs the southwest of North Vietnam through Laos and into the western side of South Vietnam. It is the capillary through which the North Vietnamese feeds supplies to the Viet Cong. Since 1966, 100,000 tons of food, 630,000 men, 400,000 weapons, and 50,000 tons of ammunition have traversed the trail. With the communists no longer able to use Cambodia as a haven and port of shipping, where 70% of their supplies had come from, they are left with Laos off the Ho Chi Minh Trail. With Cambodia eliminated as a haven and resource, the U.S. in Saigon realizes now is the time to take Laos off the board with American resources and troops still in Vietnam. Add to that an alarming increase in communist activity on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, indicating a planned North Vietnamese assault. On December 8th, Military Assistance Command Vietnam, responds to a request from the Joint Chiefs of Staff to consider an attack on Laos. They are authorized on January 7th and begin a quick planning session of just a few weeks between both American and South Vietnamese commands. Generally speaking, uh, I was not impressed with the uh, uh, Arvins, the Army of Vietnam. They uh, pretty much uh, were relegated to patrolling in the flatlands and the few times that when I was a uh, slick pilot, uh, the slicks were the, uh, our assault helicopters that would take the troops out into the jungle, resupply them and then extract them out of the jungle when they needed it. Uh, the few times that, that we did transport the Arvins, uh, we had to pretty much strip everything off of the aircraft that could get stolen because they would go and five-finger discount anything that was on the bird that could be stolen. Uh, uh, they probably were, you know, shortchanged by their own uh, government, uh, but it was, you know, when we were taking care of them, they, uh, you know, I felt that they betrayed us in that aspect. It will be a two-pronged operation. The American military's forces follow Operation Dewey Canyon 2, 
operated in South Vietnam due to the Cooper Church Amendments prohibiting forces from entering Laos. The South Vietnamese arm of the operation will be Lam Son 719, named after the birthplace of legendary Vietnam patriot Le Loi. 719 comes from the year 1971 and the vital route 9. The abandoned Khe San combat base will be the nerve center of the assault. Route 9, leading into Khe San, will be cleared by engineers for the South Vietnamese to use in their assault. The plan is for U.S. forces in South Vietnam to guard the border from within and create diversions. Following, the South Vietnamese Army will attack Laotian town Chie Ni, the perceived nerve center of the NV base 604. Finally, the South Vietnamese will carry out search and destroy missions within Techponi and, when finished, make their way back to South Vietnam. Skirting the Cooper Church, American artillery will provide support directly to the South Vietnam side of the Laotian border, while air support will be provided outside of the Khe San base. Route 9 to Laos is secured to the Laotian border by February 5th, and a new airstrip is built and ready for operation by February 15th. Meanwhile, the 101st Airborne Division begin a faint attack away from Khe San to distract North Vietnam's attention. North Vietnamese troops in base area 604 are estimated at 22,000. February 8, 1970. It starts with a 4,000-man South Vietnamese Armor and Infantry Task Force moving west down Route 9 to Laos, undisturbed. Their northern flank is covered by airborne and ranger elements to the north. Two ranger battalions are airlifted to LZs designated as early warning areas for North Vietnamese incursions. The 1st Infantry Division covers the southern flank of the advance in several LZs. It does not stay peaceful for long. American air support helicopters are fired upon by North Vietnamese artillery and machine gun positions. The poor conditions of Route 9 make it impossible for all but tracked vehicles to travel. The armored forces make it in to their objective on February 11th establishing a fire base at A. Louis, 20 kilometers inside Laos, on Route 9, where they establish central command of the operation. As the South Vietnamese forces await orders to proceed, valuable time is lost, allowing the North Vietnamese to funnel in massive troop reinforcements. The communists are kept diverted by a U.S. naval task force off the North Vietnam coast, who appear to be staging an amphibious landing 20 kilometers from the city of Vinh. They soon catch on to the South Vietnamese actions in Laos and move 36,000 troops to the area of Che Poni by March. The South Vietnamese are outnumbered two to one. By February 18th, the NV forces start attacking the fire bases. First, pounding them with long-range anti-aircraft artillery and then finishing off the job with ground troops. After three days of fighting the 39th ARVN Ranger Battalion, over 600 North Vietnamese troops are killed, but 75% of the Rangers are left alive to retreat. Meanwhile, South Vietnamese President Chu and General Lam decide to divert operations immediately towards Che Poni. Many believe that a victory in Che Poni was Chu's objective all along. It would be symbolic and boost his image for the upcoming elections. On March 3rd, elements of the 1st Division are hella lifted to two fire bases and an LZ. The damage incurred on air battalions is catastrophic. 11 helicopters are shot down and another 44 damaged while carrying a single battalion. On March 6th, 
276 UH-1 helicopters, protected by gunships and fighter jets, left two battalions from Quezon to Cheponi. It is the largest helicopter assault of the war. When the South Vietnamese forces arrive in Cheponi, all they find are the bodies of North Vietnamese soldiers killed by airstrikes. As South Vietnamese forces beat a retreat, the North Vietnamese apply further pressure. At battle's end, 7,682 South Vietnamese are killed, 215 U.S. soldiers, more than 100 helicopters are lost, and 600 damaged. It is believed that North Vietnam suffers 20,000 lost through sheer American bombardment. Perhaps the greatest enemy of the operation were the media, who stumbled on the story early and let word slip, as well as the insubordination within the South Vietnamese military. Still, Operation Lam Sun 719 was a South Vietnamese operation conducted without American advisors and seen as a step towards Nixon's Vietnamization. April 23rd, 1971. Army Warrant Officer Fred Behrens, airborne, undertakes a fateful helicopter mission to save wounded U.S. troops. It was a, uh, a hot mission, which meant that the, the people on the ground were in, co in contact with the enemy. With air cover by Cobra helicopters, Behrens and his crew are riding high stakes. His second trip, in to airlift wounded out, will place him amongst their ranks. We landed and everybody jumped on the aircraft that was on the ground and uh, as I picked it up to a high hover, uh, I got shot through the left ankle and it blew my, my left foot off the control pedal and we went into a, a hard right hand spin. Um, pain was intense and I jammed my foot down uh, back on the pedal but I couldn't feel anything but I felt my right foot coming back up and I knew that I had my foot on the on the pedal and I got the aircraft under control and I continued the turn to the left and uh, at that time they had hit us I believe in the engine with an M79 uh, grenade. His crew chief killed by enemy fire, Barons manages to bring the craft down. When he calls in a mayday, Behrens is told that the LZ is too hot for any more rescues. He is on his own in a war zone. A U.S. Cobra fires its minigun the next morning, hitting Baron and killing his crew chief with friendly fire. A North Vietnamese sniper strikes later, killing another of the crew before shooting Barons, who takes the sniper down himself. And at that time, it was just uh, myself and Isaaco Melo, this one ranger, and we moved again. And uh, a uh, you know two North Vietnamese opened up on us with their machine gun, and uh, the Isaaco was out of ammunition by that time, and I fired up on the two North Vietnamese and got them, and. Uh, uh, Isaaco said we needed to go and start heading toward the Ashaw Valley floor and I told him I couldn't, by that time I'd been shot five times and I told him I couldn't make it any further so and I told him to keep on going and he, uh, uh, we, we discussed that and he didn't want to leave me but I told him to keep on going so he got up and he ran for the floor for the Ashaw and uh, he ended up being captured the next morning the North Vietnamese are not the only threat left for the wounded barons to face, but the war zone itself. The, uh, on Sunday the 25th, I'd, I crawled out in the middle of the landing zone and uh, a fighter came in, a Phantom, and he dropped off a pair of bombs and they, went, they landed on both sides of me. I was down in a little, uh, 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 little bomb crater in between a couple of uh, tree trunks and uh, uh, and uh, bombs landed on each side of me, and blew me and my tree trunks up in the air, and uh, it uh, that I ended up getting some shrap shrapnel wounds in me, and it uh, that was I figured it was it was just about all over for me. 
A group of rangers happen upon barons while pursuing the enemy. They leave their canteens with the parched barons, hesitant to leave him. Fred Barons is medevaced out shortly after. His injuries stay with him the rest of his life. I was in the hospital for uh, almost a year and as an inpatient and uh, as an outpatient, uh, well, I'm still an outpatient, but uh, uh, I was uh, uh, being treated as an inpatient on a very frequent basis for several years afterwards. And it, uh, uh, it uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the wounds just don't heal up quickly. May 1971. From when I went in, you didn't have much of a drug problem, but when I got out, I think there was more of a big drug problem, uh, especially those going into Vietnam. They had easy access to it. Um, I know the, very, the Navy was very strict if you were caught uh, dealing in drugs and things like that. But I, I said I saw it more when I was getting out of the Navy than going into the Navy. The guys that you were with all the while, you had no problem with. You know, we had everybody's back. But a lot of new guys that were coming in, and there was drugs, a lot of drugs were starting to happen. And, uh, you know, it just, things were starting to change a lot. And I was kind of glad that I got out of there when I did. You know, I, and reading about it and hearing it on the news at night after I got home was, boy, I'm glad I wasn't there then. <laughs> Congressman Robert Steele of Connecticut and Morgan Murphy of Illinois returned from a visit to Vietnam with a startling claim. 15% of all servicemen there are addicted to heroin. Even though the military decreases that figure to 2%, Richard Nixon does not take it lightly. He had earlier submitted legislation for reform of federal drug enforcement. And on June 17, 1971, he asks for 155 million more for domestic programs. President Nixon's plan for $14 million is to increase the Veteran Administration's budget to establish testing stations and rehabilitation in Vietnam. Soldiers are now required to test for heroin use before returning home. Nearly 20% self-identify as heroin addicts, while a stunning 45% of all soldiers are revealed to have used opium or heroin at least once. Drug use was an escape from a living nightmare and one that threatens to create more nightmares for the servicemen in Vietnam. President Nixon continues to struggle back at home. He must live up to his campaign promise to end the war. However, the media continues to criticize the war in Vietnam while Nixon takes whatever measures possible to end it. It becomes a vicious cycle. Once secret actions, such as the earlier bombing of Cambodia, are found out, they receive media criticism and drive a further wedge between the president and the public. An atmosphere of distrust surrounds the government. Soon, it all goes to hell. What are the Pentagon Papers? They are a secret study, began per the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, in 1967, without the knowledge of President Johnson. Researched and written by academics, civilian employees, and military officers, the report of the Office of the Secretary of Defense, Vietnam Task Force, documents United States involvement in Vietnam from 1945 to 1967. Parts of it are leaked by an analyst who himself opposes the war, former Marine Corps officer Daniel Ellsberg. In March 1971, he provides secret photocopies to the New York Times, a research that encompasses 47 volumes and 3,000 pages of narrative. Revealed in the papers are the covert activities from the past four administrations. Truman's aid to the French against Viet Minh. Eisenhower's undermining of North Vietnam and helping Diem take over. 
Kennedy's elevation to making Vietnam a commitment and allowing the generals to overthrow and assassinate Diem. The real reason for the United States bombing of North Vietnam in 1965. It was an attempt to contain China and prevent them from organizing all Asian countries into a third world war. Also revealed is the government's planned provocation during the Johnson administration of North Vietnam to launch a major strike to justify American intervention. The Gulf of Tonkin had provided just that. The war in Vietnam appears planned from the start, with motivations different from those communicated to the American people. The U.S. Department of Justice gets a restraining order against publication after three installments have been printed. Both the Times and Washington Post take the matter to court and on June 30th win a 6-3 to three Supreme Court victory as the court recognizes the paper's First Amendment rights. Denied their legal victory, the Nixon administration charges Ellsberg and an apparent accomplice on criminal charges in 1973. Ellsberg surrenders himself to authorities and a grand jury indicts him on stealing and holding secret documents. A mistrial is called, however, when it is revealed that a covert White House team called the Plumbers burglarized the office of Ellsberg's psychiatrist in September 1971. The two men, E. Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy, will eventually lead to Nixon's downfall. Over in Paris, France, the preliminary peace talks between Henry Kissinger and North Vietnamese negotiator Li Duc Tho are stalling. That is, around the conference table. Kissinger engages Tho in secretive peace talks of their own outside the boundaries of Paris. Nixon wants the war over, especially as he faces a re-election year. North Vietnam wants freedom to keep troops of their own in South Vietnam, as well as an end to the Americans' bombing. But North Vietnam is determined to gain more leverage in negotiations, and their method of taking it is unprecedented. March 20th, 1972. With American forces diminished to only 69,000 in South Vietnam, the North Vietnamese decide to strike while their opponents are at their weakest and least defended. Their plan is designed to overtake the South Vietnamese by sheer brute force and gain more territory. Their armament is boosted by Soviet and Chinese aid, providing a total of 400 tanks for ground superiority over the South Vietnamese. The Easter Offensive begins at noon with the North Vietnamese attacking South Vietnam through three fronts with heavy tanks and artillery units. They cross the demilitarized zone and Laotian border. The attack is also a test of Nixon and his policy of Vietnamization, when he's at his most politically vulnerable. Two North Vietnamese divisions, a total of about 30,000 troops, cross the DMZ into the northern area of South Vietnam. Three South Vietnamese divisions are taken by surprise and quickly overwhelmed. Only one division is experienced, while two are no older than six months. They are also attacked while two divisions are exchanging positions and are quickly overwhelmed. Many of the inexperienced South Vietnamese troops run for cover rather than stay behind their artillery to hold the enemy. The NVA divisions drive south towards Quang Tri, located just north of decimated city of Hue. Another division attacks from the west, out of Laos, and toward the Quang Tri River Valley. The North Vietnamese cleverly time their offensive for the seasonal monsoon, which provides cloud cover that makes airstrikes by U.S. forces practically impossible. To make matters worse, Many South Vietnamese forces are either inexperienced or inept. Camp Carroll, 
a base standing between the North Vietnamese forces and Quang Tri City and boasting 1,500 troops, is surrendered with hardly any shots fired. Another base, Mai Lok, is also abandoned. The South Vietnamese that do counterattack are unable to stop the North Vietnamese juggernaut from rolling over them or forcing them, along with civilians, to flee. North Vietnamese forces gain Quang Tri City on May 2nd. South Vietnamese will have their day in the city of An Lok. Located between Saigon and a basin in Cambodia, North Vietnamese value An Lok's strategic importance. On April 8, 1972, the North Vietnamese decimate Lok Ninh, a small town 20 miles north of An Lok. As over 35,000 troops converge on the city, South Vietnamese forces anticipate the invasion and, at about only 7,500 strong and cut off by enemy forces, know that they must make a stand. The North Vietnamese arrive on April 13th, but find themselves unable to break into the city, held at bay by the South Vietnamese. On April 19th, the U.S. Air Force is able to intervene with air support. When enemy forces push for an all-out assault on the city on May 11th, they face determined South Vietnamese troops, as well as bombing by several B-52s. Their final attempt is on May 12th, but that too is stopped, as the South Vietnamese troopers now benefit from reinforcements. 66 days after it begins on June 18th, the Battle of An Lok is over. For South Vietnam, it is a victory, and won through the intervention of American air power. Con Tum, in the central highlands of Vietnam, is also of strategic importance to the North Vietnamese. Taking the capital city will effectively let them cut South Vietnam in half. Defending Con Tum are two corps, led by Lieutenant General Ngo Zhu, and the U.S. 2nd Regional Assistance Group, led by civilian advisor, Lieutenant Colonel John Paul Van. Van receives intelligence of an impending battle earlier in the year and has increased B-52 attacks in February and March, while Tzu gathers his ARVN forces for the coming doom. On April 23rd, in the midst of the Easter Offensive, the North Vietnamese attack nearby Tan Khan, protected by South Vietnam's 22nd Division. Enemy tanks and artillery are no match for the panicking 22nd. As the North Vietnamese tanks roll in on Tan Khan in two columns the next day, the 900 support troops of the 22nd panic and start to flee. With no hope for an air extraction and most of the unit trapped in the base, it is chaotic. Much of this, as Lieutenant Colonel Van notes when he arrives in Tan Khan in his helicopter under heavy fire, is the lack of composure from the 22nd's Colonel Dot. Van evacuates roughly 50 wounded and many civilians, and then does his best to rally the ground troops, who are becoming quickly overwhelmed by the invading forces. For this, as well as his directing airstrikes on enemy tank and anti-aircraft positions, Lieutenant Colonel Van becomes the first civilian since World War II to be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. The North Vietnamese continue on their way to Tan Khan, and Van fears for the army led by an already panicking Tzu. Van relieves Tzu and takes control of the ARVN-2 Corps' force. Tzu is sent off to Saigon and replaced by Major Tuan, also brought in is Colonel Ba and his experienced 23rd ARVN Division. On May 13th, enemy artillery and tanks attack Kontum from both the north and south. They are repelled by both M72 LAW missile launchers and TOW missiles. 
The light anti-tank weapon is a portable single-shot weapon to be disposed after firing its payload, a 66mm anti-tank missile. Weighing only five and a half pounds, the LAW could withstand the elements as the rocket was sealed in the launch tube. It will prove itself crucial in Kontum. The North Vietnamese continued to attack, on and off, for the next three days. On May 16th, they are relentlessly bombed by a B-52, breaking their forward momentum. Van will direct 300 B-52 strikes to the course of the battle. Attacks keep coming over the next two weeks, culminating in the final battle for Kontum. May 26, 1972. It is early morning. The North Vietnamese begin their attack on Kontum from the north with both tank and infantry. Air support from a claw helicopter destroys nine tanks, two machine guns, and a truck. The attack halts barely after sunrise. But as darkness falls, the North Vietnamese step up their game and attack once more. Two B-52 strikes neutralize them. May 27, 1962. The 44th Regiment awaken the next morning to find enemy tanks 50 yards from their bunker. There was, it seems, a flaw in the defensive perimeter. If the tanks make it further, they will invade Kontum and take the city. They are stopped by LAW missiles. The next day, the North Vietnamese managed to take over a number of buildings and bunkers in the city. They are, however, on their own as supplies are cut off by the Allies' air support. Beaten, the North Vietnamese begin a retreat by June 6th. What is left of their forces are cleaned out in a building-to-building -building sweep by South Vietnamese forces. On June 9th, the city of Con Tum is declared fully secure. A tragic footnote involves Lieutenant Colonel Van. As he is carried in his helicopter from Victory that night, his pilot fails to see a stand of trees in the fog. Well, I worked the burn unit one time for a while, and we had 75 to 85 percent chop, uh, burns from chopper pilots who went down with their plane, with their choppers, and we would have to go in, mask, gown, gloves, etc. We'd take sterile water, we'd wash their bodies down. Then we'd take these big jars of what we called sulfamyelon, which was an antibiotic cream, put our hands in it and just literally ice down their bodies with this cream. June 17, 1972. Back in Washington, D.C., the security guard for the Democratic National Committee's Watergate headquarters notices signs of a break-in. Tape is placed over the building's locks. When the police arrive, they catch five burglars who have connections to President Nixon's committee to re-elect the president. They had been setting up wiretaps on DNC phones and photocopying secret documents. April 30th, 1973. Last June 17, while I was in Florida trying to get a few days rest after my visit to Moscow, I first learned from news reports of the Watergate break-in. I was appalled at this senseless, illegal action. And I was shocked to learn that employees of the re-election committee were apparently among those guilty. I immediately ordered an investigation by appropriate government authorities. On September 15, as you will recall, indictments were brought against seven defendants in the case. Nixon will deny any connection with the Watergate break-in. But for days after, the president had secretly provided payoffs to the five burglars and two accomplices. His subsequent plans are to get the CIA to stop the FBI investigation. 
The Watergate scandal will not be the only thing that will come back to haunt the president. The nation is stunned when, in the June 19, 1972 edition of Newsweek, the magazine's Saigon bureau chief, Kevin Buckley, and Alexander Shimkin exposed the military operation Speedy Express from December 1968 to May 1969. The operation was a land rush by the U.S. 9th Division designed to root out Viet Cong hostilities within Kien Hoa in the Mekong Delta province. The U.S. 9th Division's commander, Major General Julian Ewell, becomes known within the military as the Butcher of the Delta. He apparently views success in battle per body count amassed. Newsweek charges that nearly 5,000 civilians were killed throughout the operation. The death toll there, Buckley writes, made the My Lai massacre look trifling in comparison. Speaking with the nearby civilian hospital in Ben Tre, Buckley notes that nearly 1,431 civilians are wounded by friendly fire in the course of Speedy Express. Paris, France. Kissinger fights his diplomatic war at the long-running preliminary peace talks in Paris. Finally, after two years, in October 1972, both sides reach an agreement for a ceasefire. U.S. troops will be withdrawn while POWs are released. President Nixon suspends all bombing on October 22nd. Weeks later, on November 7th, 1972, President Nixon once more wins the office of the presidency in a landslide, having gained 60% of the popular vote over opponent George McGovern. Because of America's bold initiatives, 1972 will be long remembered as the year of the greatest progress since the end of World War II toward a lasting peace in the world. The peace we seek in the world is not the flimsy peace, which is merely an interlude between wars. The Paris peace talks for ours had been going on since 1968. And, uh, you know, no, they'd say, they argued the size of the table, where we're just dragging it out because they're still trying to take long enough to raise another crop of young men to go get killed. But the war is far from over. South Vietnam's leader, Nguyen Van Thieu, demands conditions for the treaty that sets negotiations back with Hanoi as talks end on December 13th. What's the future of the Paris peace talks? Uh, I think that the uh, sort of discussions that have been going on, on the Paris, in the Paris peace talks are not affected by such temporary ups and downs as the private peace talks. So I'm sure that, that Minister Xuan Tui and Ambassador Porter will find many subjects for mutual recrimination. Nixon, anxious to have the war over with, promises South Vietnam $1 billion in military equipment and a promise for U.S. intervention in the event of renewed aggression from North Vietnam. As for North Vietnam, they trade accusations and charges with the United States, leading to their rejection of peace and the president's frustration. Nixon will have to remind them of the firepower yielded by the United States and give them no choice but to negotiate. Nixon gives Hanoi three days to resume negotiations, along with the promise of grave consequences if not. Hanoi ignores the ultimatum, and they are about to face the president's wrath. And so starts Operation Linebacker 2, also known as the Christmas bombing. And it, it would have been real easy for us to go and fire up those B-52s and, and, you know, laying waste to North Vietnam and, uh, and laying, you know, uh, mining the Haiphong Har Harbor all over again. 
December 18th, 1972. Within three days, 207 B-52 bombers split between bases in Guam and Thailand, and several support aircraft are prepared for this unprecedented airstrike in the war against North Vietnam. Targeted by this first wave of bombers are North Vietnamese airfields at Kep, Phuc Yen, and Ho Lok, as well as a warehouse complex in Yen Vien. The second and third target is Hanoi itself. Operation Linebacker is only intended to last for three days, but the president extends it beyond that. While aircraft continue to target airfields, transportation hubs, and industrial sites, such as oil storage, part of a hospital is accidentally bombed. As the third phase of Operation Linebacker 2 continues, on December 26th, Nixon gets Hanoi to agree to resume discussions on January 2nd. Still getting resistance from South Vietnamese President Chu, Nixon finally threatens to sign the peace without him. South Vietnam finally agrees. The Christmas bombing ends on December 29th. 2,000 sorties have been flown, dispensing 35,000 tons of bombs. North Vietnam is in shambles, with 25% of their oil and 80% electrical capacity destroyed. Approximately 1,624 North Vietnamese civilians are killed. The troops have been out since early 72. They're, you know, they're pulling them all out and, and downsizing. The only, only people we had in there at the end of 72 were um, uh, advisors. And the South Vietnamese Army was, was, was doing just fine um, on their own. We just, we just had advisors in there. Um, and we, we, didn't, we knew that. We knew they were coming down. They keep saying, see, they're going, to, they're going away. They're going to leave you here. We're going to keep you forever. And, um, and then the bombing started again. And it wasn't very much. We didn't hear it. It was down below a certain parallel. And uh, but we'd, we could hear them screaming about it, and the U.S. aggressors, are, and we'd see a reconnaissance airplane go over every once in a while. But then the uh, Christmas bombing in 1972, they'd evacuated half of us up to the Chinese border um, in, a, in a camp up there. Um, but the B-52s finally, and missions that were planned in 1965, finally in 1972, late 72, executed these things, and within 60 days we were home. They, uh, I mean, they um, vir virtually shut North Vietnam down, and they weren't going to recover on their own. China couldn't do it. Russia couldn't do it. The only one that could build them back is us. And so they, uh, they went. They, they started talking Turkey, and they set up the POW release. December twelfth, nineteen seventy-two. All has not been in vain, and all we have to do is kind of reorganize, reevaluate, and Rome wasn't built in a day and we can't overcome all the injustices or make this a perfect world overnight. But we are on our way and we are going to do just that before it's over. Upon leaving the presidency, Lyndon B. Johnson returned to his ranch home in Stonewall, Texas. In 1971, the Lyndon B. Johnson Public Library opens in Austin, Texas. Having suffered from heart problems the last few years, President Johnson has a massive heart attack on January 22, 1973. President Lyndon B. Johnson dies on January 22, 1973, at age 64. His death comes a month after that of former President Harry S. Truman and a day before an historical event in the Vietnam War. January 23, 1973. 
Beaten by the Christmas bombing and already weakened by the Easter offensive, the North Vietnamese are in little position to refuse the October treaty that they'd earlier abandoned. North Vietnam and the United States signed the Paris Peace Accords on January 23, 1973. But the war in Vietnam is not over. Not over there, nor at home. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.